Good morning, everyone. My name is Ramsey Adcock. It's a real joy to be broadcasting live from our building. And whether you're here with me in person or joining us online from home, a very warm welcome to this service from Jesmond Parish Church. Today, we celebrate and give thanks for our partnership as a church with Bury in Kenya. They are also celebrating our partnership this morning. And what unites us is the great God that we both serve a God who is faithful and strong and with us as we meet. In Swahili, praise the Lord is Buana Asifwe. And our, in our first song, we encourage one another to do just that, to sing praises to the Lord. So let's stand, and if you're in the building, then you can hum, or if you're at home, you can sing. And let's give thanks to our Lord. Take a seat. Buana Asifwe, praise the Lord. He is indeed worthy of praise. He is faithful and strong. There is nothing that he cannot do as our loving Heavenly Father. And he does want to and he can give good gifts to his children. Yet even though we have tasted his goodness, we so often would rather trust in ourselves. We place our hope in our own talents in our own abilities, in relationships with people we admire and love, in our jobs, in good health, or in our academic abilities. Though we know better, we hope in ourselves rather than in the Lord. So let's use now together the words of our confession prayer to say sorry for all of our sins. Whether you're in the building or at home, we can say this out loud together. So together we pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word 
and deed. In the evil we have done, and in the good we have not done. Through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry, and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And so, Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it's time now for the talk for our young people. If you're watching online, you'll find links with this video for the resources uh, that accompany this talk. But first, we're going to hear from Chloe Pramana. She's in our Explorers group. She's going to read God's word before Dan McBride explains it for us. Good morning. Our first reading is from Matthew, chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Hi folks, I wonder, have you ever been in a situation where there was absolutely no light. You know, it's night time and the electricity goes out. No TV, no computer, no light, no nothing. It is pitch black. Dad is stumbling around the garage trying to find the torch that he says is there. Mum is hunting out the candles from the back of the kitchen cupboard. No one can find the matches and you keep tripping over the couch. Has that ever happened to you? It's annoying, it's irritating, people rub each other up the wrong way. Hey, it's maybe even a little bit scary. But now imagine that the whole world went like that. You know, for some reason, there is no more moon or stars in the night sky. The sun itself has vanished, no light anywhere at all. Total, inescapable darkness. Now that is scary, isn't it? It kind of sounds like end of the world stuff. But actually, darkness is a perfect picture for what our world is actually like, spiritually. It is a world of blindness and darkness where people stumble around in confusion, desperately trying to make sense of everything. And into this dark world, Jesus has put his disciples so that they can bring light. We are back in our short series, wrapping it up today, actually, where Jesus has been telling us what a disciple looks like. And we have seen that a disciple longs for what God promises, a disciple stands for what is right, and a disciple makes a difference in other people's lives. And this morning, Jesus gives us one more thing that a disciple does. Disciples bring light. Have a look at what he says. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus says his disciples are like light. They shine out in a pitch black world, not for their own benefit, no. They shine in order to point people to God. So let's check out exactly how a shining disciple does that. Here's the first thing. If you have ever tried to play sport at night with no floodlights, you know that you just cannot see a thing. You can't see the ball, you can't see your teammates, you can't see the goal. Light helps you see clearly. And a shining disciple of Jesus does just that. We help other people see clearly. Because, you know, we can help other people see what God is really like, because we have got to know him ourselves through his word. We can help other people get to know him too. And we can help people see what they are really like, wonderfully created by God, but damaged by sin and in desperate need of forgiveness through Jesus. We can help people see those important things clearly. Imagine you're out for a drive on a country road late at night and suddenly the headlights go out. Ah! You can't drive like that. You don't know where you're going. You need light to guide the way ahead. And a shining disciple of Jesus does just that. Because look, 
people sometimes don't know what way to go in life, do they? You know, a big decision comes along and what choice do they make? Well, we can help guide the way ahead because a disciple of Jesus knows that living the way that God tells us to live is the best life imaginable. We can show people that. You're out for a walk along the road and suddenly a whole stream of vehicles come flying past you, bright lights flashing everywhere, ambulances, fire trucks, police cars. What do the lights tell you? That something is wrong, that there is danger up ahead. And the disciple of Jesus can do that as well. We can warn people of danger. You know, we can warn people that sin sets us all on a collision course with God, and that only ends up really bad for us. We can help people see that danger and show them how to get right with God by putting their trust in his son. What's the difference between going out for a walk during the day and going for a walk at night? Darkness is scary. I mean, there's loads of places I wouldn't go for a walk in the dark. Maybe you too, but light, that brings safety, doesn't it? And a shining disciple of Jesus is just the same. Because the people who do not know Jesus are walking around in this world in darkness. And that can sometimes be scary, can't it? But we can help people make sense of things. We can help them see exactly where they fit into this world. And we can show them that they have a loving heavenly father who desperately wants to protect them. A disciple can bring safety. Now, those are some pretty powerful things that a shining disciple of Jesus can do, aren't they? And it is all because light overcomes darkness. I mean, think about it. You're standing in a dark room and what happens when you open the door? Does the darkness fly out and make the next room dark as well? No, no way. As soon as the door opens, the light comes flooding in and lights up that dark room. Light overcomes darkness, which means that as you live with Jesus as your king and as you shine for him, your light will overcome darkness. Now, you might feel like you're just a teeny tiny candle flickering away in a pitch black room with a light that can barely be seen. But remember, it is Jesus who has placed his disciples here to bring light. And it is his light that shines through us. Jesus is the most powerful person there's ever been. So have no fear. His light will always win. However, as we wrap up, there is one big question that he wants all of his disciples to think through, and it's this one. Where am I shining for Jesus? Where? Because have a look again at what he said. He tells his disciples, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus says that he is ready to make us shine some pretty powerful stuff, but he also knows that sometimes we are just tempted to hide away instead. You know, maybe we shine really brightly at church with other disciples, but the second we are out in the world with our friends or our colleagues, we switch the light off. You see, Jesus knows that, but he wants us to see that as brilliant as it is to shine brightly when we are with other Christians, that is not where the light is desperately needed. No, it is desperately needed by all the folk who are still stumbling around, not knowing Jesus, confused about what way to go. That is where Jesus' disciples must shine the brightest. And Jesus promises to be with us every time we do. So chew over that question, where am I shining for Jesus? You know, is there someone in the dark that he has placed me near who I can bring light to? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you call us to be shining lights, helping a dark world see the truth about you and about your incredible offer of life with you as king. Please help us to shine where we're needed and to never switch our light off. Amen. Now here is a song that reminds us that the most important thing we do as we shine for Jesus is to keep him in that number one position. So let's sing together. Jesus, number one. One, two, three, four. 
Well, today is the 34th anniversary of the, start, of the start of the wonderfully fruitful partnership that JPC has with uh, the parish of St. Philip's in Kenya, in Buri. Um, that is in the southern slopes of Mount Kenya in the Diocese of Kerinyaga. Over the years, there have been many visits between us in both directions, and we've been a great blessing to each other. Now, when our partnership started in 1987, there were just plans and a field. Now, there is a developed church site, a thriving church, a medical clinic, and a successful Christian primary school. We're so thankful to God for all that he has done. Mr. Mwendwa has been our main link and the coordinator of the St. Philip's Center from the start with his wife, Joyce. This picture was taken there by Jonathan Pryke, our senior minister, on a visit that he made there. Bury is a lush and fertile farming area with marram, red clay roads. Mwendwa, like many others around, grow bananas, beans, coffee, and more. You can see here a picture of the nursery class that was then based at the center. It's now moved to the primary school. And when he visited, Jonathan Pryke was treated to songs from different groups, different groups including the school children, the choir, the, mother, the youth, and the mother's union. Mwendwa works with Patrick, who helps to coordinate the center. And the Bury Christian Primary School along the road from the center was built with funding from a donor through the Jesmyn Trust and is now a great blessing to the local community. These are very hard times for our brothers and sisters in Bury. We sent them a message earlier in the week, and they in turn have sent us one back, and I'm going to read that now. This is from uh, Mr. Mwendwa, the coordinator, and Reverend Charles Muriyuki, who's the vicar. Greetings to you all as we celebrate the 34th, as we celebrate the 34th partnership in gospel of our churches. It is a bad experience of COVID-19, which is all over the world and has affected the churches. Many people around our community have died, and it is our concern to pray to God, who is merciful and will hear our prayers. Let our partnership be fruitful, and many people will know God. God bless you. 
Well, with that in mind, let's pray for them now. Father God, we thank you for our partnership with the Christians in Bury, Kenya. We pray for the vicar at St. Philip's as he preaches uh, Bible truth and visits those in need as he is able. We ask that you would strengthen and equip your people with all they need to live faithfully for you in these testing days. We pray for Mr. Mwendwa and Joyce and the work of St. Philip's Community Centre, especially their work with older people, that there would be sufficient funds to do all that is needed. We pray too for the work of the Jesmond Clinic and especially for the new clinical officer starting work this Tuesday, the 5th of May. And finally, we ask that you would comfort in your fatherly goodness all who are in any way afflicted or distressed. Give them patience in their sufferings and deliver them out of their afflictions. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let's continue now in prayer, using the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Leslie Williams is going to lead us now as we continue in prayer. Good morning. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you that we can come before you now, safe in the knowledge that you listen to us and care about every aspect of our lives. Thank you that even though you created the whole universe, you are still interested in every intricate detail of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you dwell within us and empower us in our fallen lives to seek to grow more like you. Lord, we pray for our Queen and for our government. Please comfort the Queen and the Royal Family at this time of loss and sorrow, and we pray that the Queen's faith in you would be a great strength to her and her family. Lord, we pray for the government as they continue to make decisions about the relaxation of rules around COVID. Please grant them wisdom and insight, and please help them to guide the nation clearly at this time. Lord, we pray for the vaccination programme. Thank you that we are blessed and privileged in this country to have ready access to plentiful vaccines without charge. We pray for the countries in the world who are not only struggling to contain and treat COVID because of poverty and lack of sanitation, but who are also likely to have to wait a long time for vaccines to be available. Please help vaccine provision to be fair and equitable and please sustain medical staff in countries such as India where the infection rates are very high as they struggle to save lives. Lord, we pray for Jesmond Parish Church as the COVID rules relax and more face-to-face -face activities become possible. We pray for the logistics of a return to face-to-face -to -face worship, that you would bless those involved in the decision-making and guide them clearly. As the number of in-person services increase over the next few weeks, we pray for safety and for good numbers of people to feel secure in attending. And as the children's and youth work increase their face-to-face -face meetings, along with the return of meetings for mums and babies and toddlers, we pray that you would bless these groups and facilitate good times of fellowship. We also pray, Lord, for wise decisions about events such as Holiday Club and House Party this summer, and for good opportunities for teaching and fellowship amongst the young people, however these events happen. Lord, we also pray for students and for the universities and colleges Christian Fellowship. Thank you for the support that UCCF provides for Christian unions throughout the country. We pray for staff workers and relay workers in the challenging situations that they have found themselves in over the past year. Please encourage them and bless them as they support Christian unions in sharing the gospel in creative ways. And please help Christian students to be bold in proclaiming your name to others. Lord, we also pray for those who are sharing the good news of the gospel with those in other countries. Please protect those who are working overseas from the challenges created by COVID and please encourage them in their work for you. We pray particularly for the Potter family as they prepare to return to Mozambique. Please encourage them as they sort out the logistics of their return and we pray that they would know your hand guiding them very clearly in each step of their preparations. Finally, Lord, in a moment of silence, we pray for those known to each one of us who are in particular need of your peace, presence and comfort at this time. Thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Thank you so much, Leslie. Now, can I make sure that those of you watching online know that from next Sunday, the 9th of May, our morning service is going to be streamed at 11 a.m. instead of 10.30 a.m. The evening stream, however, remains at 6.30 p.m. Well, now before John Teasdale speaks, we're going to hear our second Bible reading. That's going to be read by Chloe's father, Stevin Pramana. Good morning. Our second reading is from Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 8. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth.
Good morning, everyone. Do take a seat. Isn't it good to, uh, to be back and uh, preaching and leading? And we're getting there. Uh, we are getting there, but it's, uh, it's taking uh, time. So we've had a few technical problems this morning. So uh, if you're watching now on the catch-up, uh, I understand it didn't happen uh, properly live, but if you're watching on catch-up, welcome to you as well. So we're in the middle of uh, a series called Seven Weeks That Changed the World. And uh, in this series, we're, we're tracking Christian history from Jesus' resurrection uh, to the birth of the church. And today we have come uh, to the start of the book of Acts. And Acts is a book like no other, in that it vividly portrays this seismic change, if you like, uh, for the world. At the start of the book of Acts, there is no church. Uh, there are no Holy Spirit-empowered uh, disciples. They have no courage. They have no authority. They have no direction, no purpose, uh, if you like. But by the end of the book, the situation is very different. This group of ordinary men and women um, have become so utterly transformed and empowered that the world will never be the same again. You could say they've been emboldened with a God-given power to teach and proclaim the good news of Jesus to anyone who will listen. And the new church spans the whole of the Roman Empire, from Rome, if you're Roman, to Jerusalem, or if you're, if you're Jewish, from Jerusalem to Rome. But it spans the whole of, of the empire. Now, we're not going to go to the end of, the, of Acts in, in this series. We're just going to spend some time in the first uh, few chapters. Uh, we've been in Luke, and, and here we are in, in, in Acts. And right here at the start of Acts, Luke, who is the writer, he makes crystal clear how this change, this, this seismic change, if you like, will, will take place. God's plan is that his gospel will be proclaimed all over the world by his Holy Spirit-empowered people. That's how change took place then. It's how change takes place now. God's plan is that his gospel will be proclaimed all over the world by his Holy Spirit-empowered people. So before we look at that uh, in more detail, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. And we thank you that he is alive today. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we ask now that he would do his work in our hearts this morning for the good of your kingdom. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Three headings uh, this morning then, and the first is this, the end of the beginning. The end of the beginning. Take a look at uh, verse 1, if you have a Bible in front of you, of Acts chapter 1. You might have it on your phone. Uh, you hopefully you may have brought a Bible with you in some, uh, uh, of some description. But uh, this is Acts 1. It will be on the screen as well. In the first book, this is what Luke begins, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So let's get our bearings. Uh, we really do need to understand uh, that the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are a two-part work by, by Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke was, of course, a friend. He was a, an associate of the Apostle Paul. And his two-volume work is addressed to this chap called Theophilus. With the expressed intention, don't forget, to write an orderly account so that we may have certainty concerning the things that we have been taught. Now, that's the, the start of, of, of Luke. Uh, we've covered that before. And here, in verse 1 of Acts, Luke begins by linking back to that gospel account. In effect, he says that was part 1, uh, and part 1 was all about what Jesus began to do and teach. It is, if you like, the end of the beginning. But the implication is that Jesus is very much in both parts. So often we think, don't we, Gospels, Jesus, Acts, Church. But from the outset, what, what Luke says is, Gospels, what Jesus began to do, Acts, what Jesus continued to do. And Luke wants his readers to know that Jesus is still very much alive and at work. In, this, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. Hang on. Jesus was taken up to heaven. We saw that last week, didn't we? The disciples worshipped. They praised him as, as he went. How is he going to continue this work 
when he's in heaven. Keep reading. Verse 2 says, Until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. The answer to that question, Jesus will continue his work through his people in the Holy Spirit's power. And what is that work? It is the growth of the kingdom of God by this risen king, by the risen Lord Jesus, the one who is risen from the dead, the one who is very much alive. Luke is at pains to to make this point. Take a look at verse 3. He presented himself alive to them after uh, after his suffering by many proofs. Appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. I don't know about you guys, but I have been so encouraged by spending time looking again at these proofs uh, as we do uh, after, after, at Easter and after Easter. The proofs that Jesus have, has risen from the dead. The empty tomb. First discovered by the women. We were reminded about that. You know, well, you know, if you were make, you know, if you were wanting something watertight, you wouldn't have uh, allowed this story to, to have been the empty tomb to have been discovered by the women. The appearance on on the road to Emmaus, when when Ramsey was spe- speaking to us, and those disciples, you know, they had hope, but we had hoped for something else. And now what? And then the risen Lord Jesus comes to them. And there's that wonderful moment, isn't there, where it says, "And our, did our hearts not burn within us as Jesus was alongside us?" The sudden appearance of, of Jesus in the disciples' midst uh, as, they, as, they, as they were allowed to touch the very wounds in his body, the wounds of his suffering. He, he ate fish with them. He, he continued teaching them. Yes, we can have confidence from these proofs that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Sin is, con- sin is conquered. Death is defeated. The kingdom is established. In his ministry, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God is near, the kingdom of God has come, and it is established. It is the end of the beginning, but there is still work to do. And for that work, followers of Jesus need an essential equipping, an essential equipping. That's our second main heading uh, this morning. So take a look down at verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What does Jesus mean by this? Clearly, Jesus had spoken to his disciples about what the Father's promise was. Perhaps he had mentioned the way God had promised to work in 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 ways by his spirit and and the the, the prophet Jeremiah and Ezekiel had spoken about. Maybe Jesus was referring with his disciples to Joel 2, in which God says, it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and that the Lord would call his remnant in Jerusalem. But whatever the specifics of that, Jesus makes very clear that the words of John the Baptist are about to be fulfilled. In other words, God's plan is progressing. That's what we are supposed to see here. The plan is progressing. God's promise is about to be fulfilled. And the place of of Jesus' rejection, the place of that that horrific kind of negative negativity in the world's eyes where he was put on the cross and where he suffered And where the disciples scattered, where the dream had come and ended almost in, in, in tatters, that place, Jerusalem, was about to witness the beginning of a new mission. Don't leave Jerusalem. This is where phase two will begin. And for it to begin, guess what? You need my power. This is what Jesus is saying. Now, as we read God's word, we need to be careful because it it is very easy to read verse 5 and go ahead actually to, to, to verse 8 as well, which says, um, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's very re- easy to read these, these verses, to then jump ahead to Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit comes, the wind, the fire, the speaking in tongues. 
And then it's very easy for us to make the leap, leap immediately to ourselves. We'll, th we'll think to ourselves, well, we're Jesus' followers. We'll receive the Holy Spirit just the way they did when we really become Christians and we're sent on our mission by God. And, and if, if some don't, well, that then might mean that they're not really Christians at all. And we need to be very, very careful with that. Because just because Luke records the apostles receiving the Holy Spirit in a particular way here, it doesn't mean that it is this way for all Christians throughout all time. Those first disciples were unique. Their time, the, 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 the time they were living in was unique. It was a crucial turning point in God's history of salvation for all humanity. It was a crucial a turning point and and as such it needed to be appropriately signaled it needed to be appropriately signposted not just for them but for all of us who, who follow afterwards nevertheless with that plea for for caution sort of hopefully noted the point here to make is that all Christians are baptized in the Holy Spirit in the sense that the Lord has given himself to us all in the person of his Holy Spirit. And that is an incredible, incredible truth. And with that essential, we could say mind-boggling equipping of God himself, we are supposed to take on this new mission. This is my third and final point. A new, a new mission. Of course, it's not new. Not, not from God's perspective, at least, it's not a new mission. This was his plan all along from before the foundation of the world. But from the perspective of human history, it was new. From the perspective of, of, of the disciples, their whole frame of reference, if you like, was, was about to be, was being radically redefined. Something significant had taken place. Take a look at verse 6. So when they had come together, they, the disciples, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Do you see what they were expecting? Okay, Lord, we, we got it wrong. Yeah, you, you, you came on a donkey, not a war horse. We've got that now. You were overthrown on that cross. You didn't come to over, oh, oh, but we were expecting you to overthrow. You didn't overthrow in that way. But now, Lord, now you're alive. Now, now you've risen. Now is the time that you will restore, is it? That you will restore Israel's national independence? Is now the time that you will empower an army to destroy those who, who don't love you? Is it now, Lord? And they're still not quite there, are they? Bless them. <laughs> But neither would I be, neither would you be if you, if you were there then, I don't think. And Jesus is patient. Uh, he is gentle. A direct yes or no to their question is not what they needed. How similar can we be? Sometimes we have direct questions for God, don't we? And a direct yes or no may not be what we get. Very often it's not what we need, actually. And Jesus says, trust me, relax, calm down. God has got this. He's in control and nothing but nothing will stop God's plan unfolding when and how he has intended that plan to unfold. Nothing. And in a way, that's what he says to his disciples in verse 7. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. It's not for you to know, but here's what you do need to know. Here is the answer to the, here's the real answer to the question that you're asking, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And, and here are your new orders, here is your new mission, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Here, then, is the new mission for those first believers. Here is the mission for every believer that has followed since. We are called to something greater than ourselves. We are called by somebody greater than ourselves. 
He calls each one of us to get involved in his mission, to play a part in expanding his kingdom for the glory of his name. It's not about our dreams. Mary, one of the first. Peter, Paul, Lydia, Timothy, witnesses for the risen Lord Jesus. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Maybe some more modern names. William Carey, Hudson Taylor, Amy Carmichael, Jim Elliot. Witnesses for the risen Lord Jesus to the ends of the earth. What about us? Witnesses in the northeast. Friends of ours who have moved on. Witnesses now in other parts of the country. When we become Christians, the sooner we realize that we have a new and a higher purpose, the better. And what I mean by that is that when we become Christians, our whole frame of reference, if you like, changes. We are no longer making decisions based primarily on what we want. Be it for ourselves, be it for those closest to us. We are no longer living and working from our own, for our own temporary comfort, for our own ease, building our own kingdoms. We have a much greater and way more meaningful task to do as witnesses for the Lord Jesus. And while eventually that may well take you to the ends of the earth, it begins right now in your own Jerusalem. In other words, right where the Lord has placed you. That's where it started for those disciples, right where they were. And he wants you to be his witness in the office. He wants you to be his witnesses in your families he wants you to be his, his witnesses with your school friends. He wants you to be his witnesses in that sports team. With your patients. With your students. With your clients. And you may be tempted to say, yeah, but actually there, there, there are some ways that I, I can't be. I'm not, I'm not allowed to be. Or, yeah, but it, it, it's just too hard. And I may be overstretching it here, but Acts 1.8 doesn't say, does it? It doesn't say, you will be my witnesses to the end of the earth, if you're allowed. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, if it's easy. It is a dying world out there, folks. It's a world that is dying. It's a world, as we were reminded earlier, that is in darkness. It's not fashionable to say it, but people are on a trajectory to hell. They are on a trajectory to an eternity without the Lord Jesus, without being in relationship with God. And we <laughs> have been commissioned by the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the risen Lord in the Northeast to be his witnesses. And as always, I'm preaching to myself here just as much as I'm preaching to you got this squared away how are we going to respond then well the original greek word for witnesses is um i think this is how you pronounce it martires uh from which it will come as no surprise that we get our english word martyr of course the first century greek writers wouldn't have had the connotations that we have with that word martyr for them it was a legal term it describes somebody who testified in court Someone who testified in court to something that they had seen, something they heard, something that they had experienced. So friends, that is the issue for us. Will we tell others about what we have witnessed, about what we have heard, what we have experienced in our own lives? Very much tying in with what Dan was saying earlier. Will we be that light in a dark world? It's a simple message. If you have been a Christian for a while, just take it as a, as a reminder and an encouragement of the ultimate mission you are on. If you've recently become a Christian, this is what being a Christian is all about. God's plan is that his gospel is proclaimed all over the world by his Holy Spirit-empowered people. And we need to take heart and we need to draw courage from the truth that 
We are Holy Spirit-empowered people. We are not left to get on with this task in our own strength. There's no way that I could do that. I'm sure you feel the same on a daily basis. But take heart, take courage that you are not left to do it in your own strength. Just like those followers, those first followers of the Lord Jesus, we are equipped and we are empowered to do what needs to be done and how we need to praise him for that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that uh, you have empowered each one of us to the task, to this new mission, this mission that you have called us. And so we ask just simply, Lord, at the end of this morning, that you would help us to be faithful witnesses for you. Give us the courage that we need to speak of what we have heard and what we have witnessed and what we have experienced in our own lives. We pray it for your name's sake. Amen. So we're going to sing, uh, we're not going to sing, <laughs> we're going to hum, um, sing in your hearts as I like to say, um, the, our last song tonight, uh, this morning which is Let the Nations Be Glad, please stand.
Please do take a seat. Now it's time for a few notices before we finish. The main thing to say is that from next Sunday, the 9th of May, our online morning service moves to 11 a.m. and our virtual coffee time moves to 10, 15 a.m. So please make a note of those church, uh, changes. Our afternoon youth work uh, also uh, has changed times and now meets at 4.30 in the afternoon. This afternoon, we've got explorers in the church halls and pathfinders on Zoom. Both of those are at 4.30 and Cypher is at 4.15. The stream this evening is at 6.30. Jonathan Redfern concludes our series in Philippians 4, so join us for that if you can. Uh, he'll also be preaching live at our two in-person evening services at 4.30 p.m. and at 6.30 p.m. Uh, those in-person services are socially distanced, as you know, in the building and sec uh, COVID secure. And can I assure those of you who would like to come and have been holding back uh, to allow space for others that we now have plenty of space, so there is no need to hold back. We'd love you to come if you'd like to. Uh, all the details of what else is on this week is in the weekly email, so please have a read of that if you haven't already. And if you don't receive those and you'd like to, either speak to us before you leave today or visit our website, jpc.org.uk. Here are some reminders for this week. Monday, of course, is a bank holiday, so it's bound to rain. Uh, but the good news is Celebrate Recovery is still meeting. There's also a new pattern for our daily prayer meetings this week, uh, so join us on Wednesday or Friday if you can. On Wednesday, our home groups meet to study Jonah chapter 2, and next Saturday, there's the Explore Day of Fun and the Youth Laser Tag, both of those you need to book for if you'd like to go to. Next Sunday at 9.15, we've got an in-person service with Scramblers and Climbers. We've got our morning Zoom at 10.15. We've got an 11 o'clock online and in-person service, and only one evening service next week, both in-person and online at 6.30. Looking further ahead, please save the date for the JPC Big Day Out. That's on Saturday, the 3rd of July. Uh, it'll be the Teasdale's last weekend with us, so it's a great opportunity to give them a send-off as well as spend time together as a church family. So make sure that date is in your diary. If you're online, please join us for the online Zoom at 11.40 this morning. Uh, Liz uh, Jackson says this, slowly, safely, and joyfully, church life is beginning to see more in-person events. And in the Zoom this morning, we're going to have a quick trip around some different ministry areas to see what's back, what's different, and what's new. Well, thanks for joining us this morning. Let me end now with a final prayer. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, and remain with you always. Amen. Now, at that stage, uh, our online stream will have.